Good to see you guys. Glad to have you here. And uh, we are uh, excited to be here. And again, it's, it's a privilege to have, of course, uh, uh, both uh, Pastor Tom and Pastor Brandon was uh, speaking at our new facility in Vegas. That we're actually in Henderson now. And, uh, but it was a, a great treat to have them there. Uh, I, and they were just so uh, enjoyed by our congregation. And uh, you guys really should appreciate them. Certainly, they're your shepherd. Uh, I was waiting for my congregation to break out the lighters and start swaying back and forth. They were just really enjoying those guys. But uh, So it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat, certainly in these days, that uh, there's still faithful shepherds who will preach all God's truth in these last days. And um, so it's great to partner with them. But uh, hey, just a couple quick things. Lord willing, uh, in case you're wondering, uh, Lord willing, the uh, exciting topic this afternoon, if we're still alive and still here, and you know what hasn't taken place. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll be speaking on uh, UFOs, UFOs, aliens, and why in the world did the government just come out and say, hey, they're really real. Really? Well, we better talk about that because there's an agenda. So that will be there. So hopefully you'll be there for that uh, if we're still here. Uh, but also just want to let you guys know, uh, I have to remind people all the time that YouTube is not the end all of our teachings. Uh, there are so many on our YouTube channel. We've got three different YouTube channels, but we've got so many studies that have been hacked, deleted, muted, all that stuff. If you ever want to get all the studies, 10 years plus worth of material, go to our teaching website, getalifemedia.com. What's that? That's right, getalifemedia.com. Or you can download our app, search for my name. It rhymes with Billy Chrome. You know why? Because that's my name, Billy Chrome. And you can download the app for free and stay uh, tuned in, plugged in for that. So you guys ready to go? Yes. Amen. We got a lot of ground to cover. And how many guys believe in miracles, man? Yes. Praise God. I'm glad because if I can get this done in 45 minutes, you're going to see one. All right. <laughs> So uh, let's go ahead. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. And we just turn our eyes now upon you, Jesus. And the good news, not only the good news, the great fantastic news, that if we would focus on you and your return, the unveiling, that you're coming back to this planet, you're going to rule and reign. We get to be with you. This is the best case scenario. And help us, God, open our hearts and our minds to realize that everything that we hear, even at this conference, even all today, you willing, and, and, and just during the weeks and, and, and prior to this, all the news that we see with the new world order and the, what's going on with Israel and the, the rise of famine and earthquakes and pestilence and wars and rumors of wars and technology and all that kind of stuff, even wicked behavior, which we don't condone, but all these are frankly signs from you, not to get fearful, but to get excited. It's just a reminder from you, our departure is coming very soon. And so help us to respond, not in fear, but in faithfulness, that as your bride, we would long for your appearing, not run from it. And as your bride, we get the gospel out. That's why we're still here. We're on the biggest giant rescue mission of all time. May we be found faithful. And God, as always, if there's anybody here or watching online that's not truly born again, I can be fooled, but you can. If they're not truly born again and solely only trusting in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then God, please save them. This is not a game. The rapture could happen today. And they'd be left behind, thrust into the seven-year tribulation, your wrath being poured out on this planet seven years nonstop. And even if they could somehow survive all the way to the end, if they don't get saved, the angels are going to come scoop them up and throw them straight into hell. God, please, if there's anybody in danger of that reality, save them today before it's too late. May they join us in the blessed hope, the rapture. We love you and pray and ask your blessings upon our study. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Check this out. This woman, she goes to, uh, uh, with her husband to the doctor's office, right? And he's got some troubles. And after the checkup, the doctor, he calls just the wife in all alone back to his office. And he says to the lady, he says, ma'am, he says, your, your husband, he's suffering from this very, very severe disease, right? Combined with horrible stress. In fact, if you don't do the following, your husband will surely die. And here's what you do. Each morning, fix him a healthy breakfast and be pleasant to him and make sure he's always in a good mood. In fact, for lunch, make him a nutritious meal that he can take with him back to work. And, and for dinner, prepare an especially nice meal for him. And don't burden him with chores because that could further his stress. Men, how many of you guys want this disease? <laughs> Praise God. Right? And, and that's not all, but don't discuss your problems with him uh, because it's only going to make his stress worse. And then, In fact, try to relax your husband in the evening and give him plenty of back rubs and encourage him to watch some type of team sporting event on TV and, and most importantly, satisfy his every whim. And, and here's the good news. If you can do this for the next ah, 10 months to a year, I, I think your husband is going to regain his health. So obviously on the way home, the husband asks his wife, he says, well, honey, what did the doctor say? And the wife simply says, you're going to die. <laughs> oh, pray for Pastor Tom. 
you know, but uh, whoever that was. But uh, anyway, uh, but how many guys you seem like discerning Christians? How many guys would say that marriage probably wasn't going to end on a very good note? You know what I'm saying? That husband had no clue of the dangers that were headed his way, did he? And folks, I can't think, unfortunately, of a better way to explain what I see going on with the church. The same thing's happening with the church when it comes to Bible prophecy, right? The trend in the church today is what? Hey, don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. No, I don't want to hear that. I didn't come here for that. Excuse me? As a Christian, you're supposed to hunger for all of God's word, the whole counsel of God, right? Something's wrong with that, okay? And yet the irony is this. They don't just say that. That's the trend in the church. That's most of the church today. 95% of the church, that's their attitude. But the Bible says, are you kidding me? All of God's word's good for us, but there's something about Bible prophecy. God says, I will bless your socks off, not once, not twice, three different times. But as always, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to his. He tells us this amazing promise that I will bless you. Revelation chapter one is your opening text. Go ahead and turn there. Revelation chapter one. If you find the dictionary, what do you do? Hang a left. That's right. It's the last book of the Bible there. And it's on page 1937 in my Bible. That helps uh, with you guys. Uh, I'm just stalling time as you turn there. This should be a quicker one, right? Uh, but Revelation chapter 1, the unveiling, the apocalypse of who? This book's all about Jesus Christ. If you're a born-again Christian, why would you run from this? Why would you say, I don't want to study about Jesus Christ? Excuse me? I've done a lot of marriages. And I and all I always do premarital counseling. That's just part of the deal. If you want me to marry, you're going to do premarital counseling. Right? And never once in all those years, uh, 25 plus years now, have ever had one couple, you know, because I, I wait till they get back about a month before the date. And I say, hey, I start teasing them. Hey, four weeks to go. <laughs> right? Then the next, next week, it's like, hey, three weeks to go. <laughs> Usually by the time that we get down to that last week, they're like, yeah, forget it. I just want to get this over with, you know. But, anyway, but, anyway, but they're all like, <laughs> you know, the young couples, they don't know what's coming. Right? They got all the googlies. <laughs> right? But I never once in all that counsel said, hey, hey, two weeks ago to get married. Would you stop that? That's doom and gloom. You just ruined my day. I don't want to hear that. If they did that, that's not a good sign. When we talk about the return of Jesus Christ, that's our bridegroom. We're his bride. And how could you sit there and say, I don't want to hear that. Excuse me. You got a problem. And plus, that's not what the Bible says. Let's read the text, Revelation 1, 1 through 3. The revelation, the unveiling of who? Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony, again, of who? Jesus Christ. Tortured is the one who re... Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong translation there. Doom and gloom is the one... You'll split your church right down the middle if you... What's it say? Blessed is Makarios in the Greek. It not just means spiritually prosperous. It's spiritually prosperous with joy. That's what it means. Blessed. Woohoo! Is the one who what? Reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed, he says, again, are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Why? Because the time is near. Last time I checked, Jesus Christ coming back is best case scenario. Right? And dare I say, that's what's wrong with the church today. We have forgotten we are not the losers in any equation. We are only the winners through Jesus Christ. But what we see here in our text is not just once, not just twice, but three different times. What does God say? I will bless you. Listen, all of his word again is good for us. Name one command that's bad. It's all for our good. But he says there's something about studying prophecy, man. I will bless your socks off. And, and as Pastor uh, Tom mentioned, that's technically that's three. But there's another one at Revelation 22. So it's really four blessings. But I'm not making this up. According to God, if you want to be blessed in your walk with God, how many guys want to be blessed in your walk with God? God, please bless me. Right? Then get busy studying prophecy. I didn't say he did. Right? And yet, what is the trend again in the church today? No, doom and gloom. Isn't that the phrase, doom and gloom? You're not one of those wacky conspiracy people. <laughs> right? I, we get phone calls, emails all the time. People, they, they don't even get the Bible, period. They certainly don't get Bible prophecy. And then it used to be they just would, you know, push those people away. Now those people are being told to leave the church. Who just simply ask, can you teach us, you know, one-third of the Bible? Did you know one-third of this book deals directly, indirectly with Bible prophecy? How could you sit there and say you're a faithful shepherd if you skip one-third of the Bible? Right? And then you're going to kick people out because they want it? What Bible are you reading? Well, that's the problem. They're not. So my question is, why? Why do they say this? Don't make me read this. I don't want to hear this. And certainly not week after week. After. Don't make me, You're freaking me out. Doom and gloom. Where did that come from? I think I know where. Number one, I think it's a spiritual warfare issue. 
put yourself in the enemy's shoes, right? If you're this close to pulling off the Antichrist kingdom, and boy, do we see it rise today or what? New World Order, all that baloney? Then what is the last book that you want people in? Not just the Bible, certainly the Bible, but specifically what? Bible prophecy. Why? Because Bible prophecy, this is the only book on the planet that tells you in minute detail exactly everything, how it's going to unfold, what the Antichrist is going to do, how it's going to get, it's right, of course. So he spreads this lie in this church. Oh no, take one third of the Bible and skip it. And somehow that's the new version of a loving shepherd. Excuse me? You're a hireling. You need to, the church needs to rise up and fire that guy. Or you need to go get a different job, picking peaches, changing tires. You ain't got no business teaching the Word of God. Amen. Right? But that's what it is. I really think it's spiritual warfare. At, at this time in history, what's the trend in the church? Don't tell me, keep me in the dark of what the Antichrist kingdom is going to do. No way that's by chance. Number two, the irony is those people that actually take that attitude and they act like they're the ones doing us a great service. You'll never get prophecy here, <laughs> right? The pastors, the Sunday school teachers, I don't care who it is. All the ones say, ah, I just don't want to do it. No, about the doom and gloom. Did you know that those people are actually, here's the irony, they're fulfilling prophecy yeah. in a negative way. And you don't want to be a part of that camp. I didn't say that. God did. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 through 4 says this, for a time will come. And he's talking about the church, right? When men will what? Not put up a sound doctrine. Did you know eschatology, eschatos, last things, ology, study of, the study of last things, eschatology. Did you know that's a doctrine, a biblical doctrine? No, in the last days, in the church, not the world, in the church, they ain't going to want to hear it. We're living it live, folks, this prophecy right here. And here's what they're going to do, because you've got to keep the show going, right? Instead of what? It ain't about the truth. It's not about God's word. It's about their own desires. This selfish, self-seeing, only tell me what self likes, self, 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 self. That's the number one thing in our society today. They will gather around themselves a great number. In other words, that's going to be the mass of the church. A great number of teachers to say what they're what? Itching ears want to hear, and they'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I came across this uh, years ago, I'm sitting there going like, itching ears? What, the guy get bit by fleas or allergies or peanuts? or what's, it, what do you mean, itch your ears? What's going on? So I looked it up, right? And the same thing with uh, miss. What do you mean miss, right? They're turned to miss. And so, so I looked up, at, and did you know, watch this. This is crazy. Tell me this isn't happening today. Itching ears is kenetho in the Greek. And you know what that means? To desire that which is only pleasant. Miss is muthos, and it literally means stories made up. So here's what Paul is saying. We don't get this, right? We, are always, we seem to be focused on the outside, but this prophecy tells us to look on the inside, look at our own camp. Don't just look at the wars, the rumors of wars, the pestilence of what's going on with Israel and all this stuff and technology. Here's another sign you're living in the last days. When you see in the church, all you get by and large from the pulpit is just a bunch of stories made up and pleasant things. Learn to be a better you-know-who. That's a sign you're in the last days. Folks, that's what? That's 95% of the church today. The reason why these people won't teach, because they're fulfilling prophecy in a negative way. And so my thing is, well, but God said he's, he'll bless you. Not once, not twice, three different times. So let's put that to, to, to the test. Should we listen to these hirelings or should we listen to God? Yeah, I, I'm thinking God all, and the rest of the three of you. <laughs> the rest, I'm glad you're here. We'll fix you up, right? But let's take a look at that. But folks, I, this is crazy. Are you, when God says, I will bless your socks off, Makarios and the Greek, woo with joy, woo when you study prophecy, he meant it. Think about it. When you study the prophecy, I don't know about you, but uh, it reminds me I'm going to heaven. Because we all know when the rapture happens, right? What happens? We go to that 13th aisle in Walmart, we get a $30 gift certificate. Whoa, yeah. I set the blessing hope. No, we go to heaven. Last time I checked, it's way better than here. Right? And this is, again, where am I getting this? Revelation, Bible prophecy. This is what it tells us. When you study it and read it and hear it and take it to heart, Revelation 21, 1 through 4, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Listen, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Whoa. And then I heard this loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men. He, God, will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Watch this. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's not going to be any more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Folks, that's way better than Walmart. 
Listen, the Bible says if you start tearing it apart, it says, listen, heaven is a place beyond your wildest dreams. They said, but it's not a dream. It's not opiate for the masses. It's not pie in the sky. This is our reality. Jesus Christ did not just rescue us, praise God, from eternal damnation in hell and forgiveness of our sins. And now he dwells us by the Holy Spirit. We have an intimate walk with him before we get to see him. But listen, when we die or the rapture happens, we're going bang. We're going to that place. It's a place beyond your wildest dreams. It's true. That's what he's won for us. Have we forgotten? It isn't just rescuing us from the penalty. It's giving us the promise, the reward, right? And what a reward. What's he say? He says, listen, heaven is decked out like a bridal dress. And ladies, you know, that's, that's profound. Because you know when you got married, right? It was just like, yeah, you're just pragmatic. Get, get the thing done, right? In fact, you probably just went out back and says, let me just get a bunch of old socks or some uh, curtains or something, just stitch something together and get the job done. Just get this thing over. Because that's what you do when it's time to get a dress, right? Are you kidding me? What'd you do? <laughs> you took that little square device called a credit card. You charged that baby up. You bought something super expensive. It was a one-of-a-kind deal. It was decked out with all these gyms and stuff and all that stuff. And it's a one-kind event. Woohoo! And everybody's sweating. How much that cost? Ah! <laughs> that's how heaven is. God has decked out heaven like a bridal dress. That's your first clue. Hey, it's kind of cool, right? But then he goes on. He says even more. He says what? He says there's not going to be any more death or mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And think of what that means. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says what? The great resurrection chapter, what? In the blinking of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye, bang, you get new bodies. Woo! Right? And you see, some of you young whippersnappers, you don't appreciate that, but you will if you live long enough. <laughs> All right? And so let me break that down. What's it mean to get new bodies? Think about this. Never, ever get, at the moment the rapture happens, never will you have a body that will die. It will not rot. It won't decay. It won't break down. It won't age. Is that incredible? Think of what that means, man. No more back aches. No more broken bones. No more disease. Ladies, no more anti-aging creams. That's right. <laughs> No more wrinkles, no more crinkles, no more age spots, none of that stuff. Uh, makeup companies are going bankrupt. Why? Because our bodies, the scripture says, will be imperishable. Which means, listen, never again will you have to live with this reality. Watch this. Uh, we, no more will you wake up and go to the breakfast table and you hear snap, crackle, and pop. And, and you discover you're not eating cereal. <laughs> That's you. No more will you sit in your rocking chair and you can't even get it going. Right? No more will you sink your teeth into a steak and they stay there. No more will you go to bed realizing that you and your teeth, you don't even sleep together anymore. Right? No more will you bend down to straighten out the wrinkles in your socks and realize you ain't wearing socks. That's just, you, ooh, right? It gets worse. And, and, and listen, no more will you wake up looking like your driver's license picture. No more will you, your knees buckle, but your belt won't. And listen, no more will you have more hair growing on your ears than on top of your head. What's up with that? Uh, and no more will people call you at 9 p.m. saying, uh, I'm sorry, did I wake you up? Right? Okay, and finally, no more will you look for your glasses for a half hour before you realize what? <laughs> they are on your head the whole time. Well, you won't need glasses. You won't have memory problems. Folks, this is what we're headed for. It's not pie in the sky. Our bodies in heaven will be perfect forever and ever and ever. <laughs> and when, when does it happen? Bang, it's the rapture. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's doom and gloom. I tell, I'm sorry, we're going to split the church. I better stop. Are you kidding me? In fact, it gets even better. Heaven is so cool if you keep reading the scripture, which I highly recommend. God said, he's so cool. He's like a romantic gentleman. Jesus is, isn't he? He's so awesome. He says, there's some things about heaven. I haven't told you everything. In fact, I can't tell you because you just can't with your current body limitations. You can't get it. You can't conceive. Now, see, I didn't say that. He did. Watch this, man. As cool as what we've already seen, he says this on top. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. This is what the scriptures mean when they say, listen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Your, your mind can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? You can't even imagine, man, what he's got prepared for us as his bride is going to blow you away. But see, I'm a guy, and we still have to try. Right? So let's take a look at what would happen to be like, as the scripture says, we get new bodies, which means no more sin nature, no more limitations. And what if we could just take the five senses, maybe there's more, but what if we could take the five senses and max them out? What kind of an existence would that be? Let's take a look at that real quick. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. This contains all the different wavelengths, radio waves, microwaves, including a small piece called light. 
Now your eyeball can see the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. That's all. The spectrum goes forever in both directions beyond that. Suppose we get to heaven and God gives us new eyes that can see the entire spectrum. That means there'll be brand new colors. Trillions of them. Not new shades of these colors. Brand new colors. That's why heaven has to be so large. It's for the women's closets. <laughs> My wife is going to say, honey, does this go with this? I said, I couldn't figure it out back on earth. She has to number my ties to go with my suits. It's not that I'm colorblind. It's that I don't know what goes with what. Secondly, I don't care. I just want to get dressed. Lay it out, would you? Anybody else feel that way about it? Say, don't tell me about it. Just put it together for me, please. Can you imagine if we get new eyes that can see the whole spectrum, you're going to be able to see the sounds coming off the piano. Right now we can only hear them. Imagine seeing the sounds. What if we get new ears that can hear the whole spectrum? You're going to be able to hear the colors. Wow. <laughs> or smell them. Yellow. <sighs> or taste them. Ah, green. Wow. We've only got five senses, folks. Maybe there's more. <laughs> But if God just took these five and expanded them to the max, we would spend forever walking around heaven going, wow, wow. Have you smelled that? Come here, lick that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the Bible say? No eye has seen. No ears. Heard. Your mind can't even imagine in these limitations what God has prepared for us. I'm so sorry I shared this with you. You guys are going to be in the dumps. You're going to go out there and you're going to split the church and be horrible Christians and you'll never smile again. Are you kidding me? This is not doom and gloom. I don't know about you, but this is exciting stuff. Right? No wonder God says, blessed are those who read and hear and take to heart Bible prophecy again and again. Why? Because it reminds me I'm going to heaven, a place beyond my wildest dreams where life will be absolutely perfect forever. No more tears or crying or mourning or death or pain. And it's all because you did what God said. Study all his word, especially prophecy, right? But that's just the first blessing. The second one is this, man, we're going to the millennium, right? I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes you hear Christians say, well, Pastor Billy, or, you know, it's kind of cool we're going to heaven, but I mean, don't you think after a couple of years floating on the cloud going, brum, brum, it's going to get kind of old? I mean, yeah, you and Pastor Tom and Pastor Brandon, you guys could do a little trio. Brum, 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 brum. Right? That'd be cool for a weekend, but really, that's all we're going to. Well, first of all, there's more to heaven than that. Okay, but whatever. But listen, we forget as Christians, we're not only ill equipped on the on heaven, it seems, unfortunately, we're ill-equipped on, we come back from heaven. You know that. God has designed us for this planet. And the planet and the conditions it's going to be in, in the millennium, is just amazing. Okay? In fact, one of the reasons why it's so cool is because during that time, Satan is bound. Right? And this is what we see in the scripture. Again, where am I getting this? Revelation. Revelation 20, 1 through 4. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. i got to kick this every time I see this. How many holy angels of God did it take to bind Satan? Let that sink in. See, we, we, we do two things wrong in the church. We either overemphasize the devil. Oh, the devil made me do this in the flat tire, and the demons are this, and I'm scared. Ah! God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I don't need to walk around. There. Or they go the other inspection. Did you know professing evangelicals today, 65% do not believe in a literal devil? That's the facts. So we either overemphasize or deemphasize. But here's what I love. One holy angel of God. Satan is powerful. You don't want to mess with him. He's real. But he's nothing compared to God. Amen. And we belong to God. Keep that in mind. All right? But then he goes on. So he seized him for the millennium came, and he threw him into the abyss. He locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore 
until the thousand years are ended. If you study Bible prophecy, you study Bible, which I highly recommend. Uh, guess what? You're going to see the good news. We're not just in heaven. right? We're up there for seven years during the seven-year tribulation, Revelation 19. We come back with Jesus Christ to what? Set up with him the millennial kingdom. We get to rule and reign with him. Isn't that cool? And one of the reasons why it's so awesome is you just read, that means our greatest arch enemy, i.e. Satan, is bound the whole time. Which, think about that existence. That means he can't incite the evil, the suffering, the rottenness, all that, that we deal with today. It's gone for a thousand years. And that's just one aspect. But for some reason, again, we, we, if you keep reading the scripture, you're going to see, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's cool enough to have Satan bound. But the scripture says this, Old and New Testament talks about this kingdom, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Jesus back on earth. It says this, the, the war will be a relic of the past. No more such thing as war. In fact, Jerusalem, known today for war and bloodshed and international tensions, will become a city of peace, the capital of the world. There will be religious peace between Jews and Gentiles, worshiping the Lord together on the whole planet. There will be a just economy for everyone. No longer will wealth be monopolized by only a few privileged families like the Gates and the Soros and Rock. That's all gone, baby, right? Nature will cooperate with man again. Productivity will return. No more earthquakes or tornadoes or floods. All that's going to be happening. And that's still... Just the tip of the iceberg. Satan is bound. The planet is renovated to Garden of Eden-like conditions. And here's something cool. It's going to be a righteous government. Okay? Now stop right there. Righteous government. You're probably sitting going, hey, Pastor Billy, that's one of those oxymoron things. Right? You know, like peaceful war. Icy hot. <laughs> yummy chicken. Three of you got that one. Okay, but, but you're going, there ain't no such thing. What do you mean righteous government, right? But folks, if you read the scripture, again, I highly recommend when Jesus comes back, us with him at the seven-year tribulation, the Bible says Jesus is going to be in charge of the government. I didn't say that. Isaiah did, right? How many times do you sing this, quote this during Christmas, and you don't realize you're talking about the millennial kingdom? Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, Jesus, and he, the what? The government will be on his shoulders, and he's going to be called wonderful counselor. Now the key word there is government. He's talking about the government specifically in the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes back with us at the end of the seven year tribulation, the second coming. Isaiah says Jesus Christ is going to be in charge of the global government and that's wild. And sometimes I think we, we hesitate that because we're not equipped with this time frame called the millennium, which is our future that Christ won for us. But, but sometimes we, we tend to only think of Jesus as, a, as the, uh, the lamb, right? Who, who sacrificed for our sins. And that's true. And then we've seen songs about, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He defeats our enemies. And that's true. But listen, Isaiah is telling us, did you also know that Jesus, listen, he's got another title. He's coming back to the planet to be, listen, the divine political ruler. And all two of you are excited. <laughs> now, it, it, but you prove my point. The Bible says the government is going to be on Jesus' soldiers. And I think sometimes we, we resist Jesus, politics, the government. That's kind of a weird combo. And, and rightly so, because the government, especially the current administration, uh, isn't doing very well, right? In fact, we all know it's true, folks. We all know politics. Come on. Let's just be honest. Can we be transparent for a moment? Politics. It comes from two words. Poly, meaning many, ticks, blood-sucking creatures, right? <laughs> and so that's what's going on, right? The politicians, the government gets a bad rap because uh, they do such a bad job. But so to think of Jesus as a divine political ruler, it's just kind of weird. But that's what he says. And he's not just going to be in charge of the government. He adds this phrase. He's going to be the wonderful counselor, right? Which tells us, listen, the word wonderful there is Pele in the, Greek, in the Hebrew. It says wonderful, astonishing, extraordinary, literally a marvel. So Isaiah says, listen, you've got to understand this. When Jesus is in charge of the government on the whole planet, think of what that means. It's going to be the most astounding, wonderful, extraordinary, marvelous government you could ever imagine. Why? Because Jesus Christ will be in charge. He's the only one giving counsel, and his counsel is only that which is right every single time. It's wonderful. You will never be steered wrong. He'll never do anything unjust ever. You can't bribe him. He's the one that's going to be in charge, which means never again will we experience this that we experienced from the government. Remember Nixon? Remember Nixon back in the day? Uh, I am not a crook. Remember that thing, you liar? Remember that one? Remember, remember George Bush Sr. when he said, read my lips, no new taxes. You liar. Remember Clinton? Remember Clinton? We said, oh, I do not have sexual relations with that woman. You 
Liar. And then remember right back when the economy was totally in the tank, Obama gets up there and says, the fundamentals of the economy are strong. You liar. Okay. In fact, listen, when Jesus is in charge of the government, no more will you have Joe Biden waving thanks to these people. <laughs> right? And no more will you have Hillary driving these trucks during the election time. And I tell you what, folks, no more are you going to hear statements like this from Bob Hope. He was a prophet of God. Watch this. You live here? Yes. Well, maybe you know what a zombie is. When a person dies and is buried, it seems there are certain voodoo priests who, who have the power to bring him back to life. Oh, horrible. It's worse than horrible because a zombie has no will of his own. You see them sometimes walking around blindly with dead eyes, following orders, not knowing what they do, not caring. You mean like Democrats? <laughs> oh wow <clears throat> did you know that Bob Ho was a prophet of God I didn't know that I tell you what but this is what the Bible says no more of this stuff that we're experiencing today don't you realize never on the whole planet Jesus is going to be in charge of the government his counsel is going to be wonderful he's the ultimate politician we get to rule and reign with him he's the king of kings the lord of lords the wonderful counselor nobody can bribe him you can't lobby against him you can't make him do anything wrong he only does that which is right all the time every single time there's never unjust law ever it's impossible Jesus will only do what is right for the people every single time forever and think of that what it means nobody's gonna run against him there's no option right that means listen never again no more elections no more election campaigns no more voting no more hanging chads no more rigged election machines no more mudslinging political ads no more government oppression and no more Dominion voting machines hello Nobody's going to run against Jesus. And all this new world order, baloney, man thinking in heaven's heyday, you better read Psalm chapter 2. God is up in heaven laughing at you guys going, <laughs> you really think you're going to take over my son? You better kiss the son lest he be angry with you. Because he's coming back to rule and reign. And we're with him. Let me give you one more, right? Not just Garden of Eden-like conditions. It's going to be awesome. Satan is bound. Jesus is going to be in charge of the government. I love this one. We're going to have peace with nature. Yeah. We're going to have peace with nature. Do you guys realize what that means? Right? All, not just my vicious wiener dogs. All animals are going to be tame. <laughs> right? I didn't say that. Isaiah did. Keep reading two chapters later. He talks about the millennial kingdom, right? Isaiah 11. This is what we're headed for. This is not make-believe. This is awesome. Dr. Doolittle, eat your heart out. The wolf will live with the lamb. Whoa, stop right there. If you, you know, there are actually people today say, oh, you, we're in the millennium now. Really? How's that working out for you? I don't see Satan bound. He's doing pretty well. But if you put a wolf and a lamb in a cage today, what would you have? Lamb chops is what it's called, right? <laughs> we're not in the millennium. Are you kidding me? Right? But at that time, watch this. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the cat, the lion, the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. What? Yeah, and he says, in fact, the cow will feed with the, the bear, right? Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. Everything's going back the way it was in Garden of Eden-like conditions when things were vegetarian. The animals are vegetarian. Didn't eat meat until after the flood, Genesis chapter 9. And then and it says this, uh, the infant will play near the hole of a cobra. The young child put his hand into a viper's nest. What? They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the seas. Is this incredible or what? The Bible says that, listen, all animals, all animals, including wild animals, are going to be tamed. It's going to be, if you will, domesticated Africa up across the planet. Even the leopard will be tamed like a goat. Kids can stick their hands in a viper's nest. <laughs> it tickles. That's what he's saying. And you go, oh, come on. That, that must be symbolic. You can't take that literally because there's no way that kids will be safe playing with snakes. and blind. I think God, and he's a gentleman, remember, I think sometimes he gives us a taste of how it was supposed to be before it got messed up with the fall of man in Genesis 3, but how it's going to be fixed again right in the millennial kingdom. He gives us glimpses of peace with nature. Watch this. 
It's not exactly the partner you'd expect a primate to fall for, but an unusual love story has been forced between Surya, the six-year-old orangutan, and a stray hound dog named Roscoe. For these logic-defying friends, it's all hugs and cuddles since the day they met three years ago when Surya spotted the dog from high atop an elephant while on a ride with his trainers at this South Carolina animal park. To me, they seem like long-lost friends. This other, more whimsical partnership between predator and prey has been seen on YouTube some five million times. A cat and a bird that shouldn't get along playing hide-and-seek, even wrestling. Two of nature's enemies frolicking like fast friends. From the hippo and the tortoise who sidle up next to each other, so many of these relationships are hard to explain. How's this for a unique animal friendship? 350-pound lion bone digger is best friends with a fearless seven-year-old dash hound dog named Milo. They may seem like unlikely friends, but Jericho the horse is perfectly happy to let this baboon laze on his back while they both soak up the sun. It may look like this dog's days are over, as a jaguar appears to go in for the kill. But things aren't always what they seem. In fact, this unusual pair are actually best friends. These two struck it off straight away. And now this feline-canine combo are inseparable. They don't leave each other, they feed together, sleep together, do everything together. 24 hours a day, they haven't been separated at all. They are like brothers. Sean Ellis from Devon in England has integrated himself into a pack of wild wolves. The pack itself began when the wolves, in particular, um, were only a few days of age. I still consider myself to be part of that family. Like millions of people around the world, Mark Duma loves nothing more than to take a morning swim. But for him, there is a rather massive difference as Mark swims with a polar bear. Having pet cats may sound run-of-the-mill, but Janice Haley has taken her love of felines to the extreme, keeping two huge tigers in her back garden. Sabre, a 600-pound male white Bengal, and Janda, a 400-pound Bengal female, have lived with Janice since they were cubs. With their ability to crunch through human bone in a single bite, getting up close and personal with a 1,300-pound grizzly bear is not for the faint-hearted. But for 71-year-old Doug Zeus, coming face-to-face -face with the fearsome predators is all in a day's work. Start off. Good. That's good. Ah! Good. This pairing, researchers say, is one of the strangest animal bonds ever seen. A lioness who, instead of eating her dinner, adopts it. Well, I think many people felt that this was, you know, had to be a message from God. Um, this was a miracle. This was, you know, the lion and the lamb laying down together. This is, this is a true story. It's about a lion named Christian. Okay, there were two men who adopted the lion, Ace Berg and John Rendell, and they bought the lion from Harrods Department Store. Who knows that they, you know, who thought right. they, so cubs. And in 1969, and the little cub weighed uh, 35 pounds. A year later, the little cub had grown, and he weighed 185 pounds. Mm -hmm. This is a love story, a true love story. Take a look. Man and beast. <laughs>
Wow. I'm sorry, that was doom and gloom again. <laughs> sorry to ruin your day. That's, it's going to be a split now, and I'm just going to get in trouble for it. Pastor Tom's never going to invite me back again. I'm gonna... <laughs> That's coming to the whole planet. Yeah. And we're going to be a part of it. Don Perkins, another prophecy uh, teacher, uh, he's so into this, and every Christian should be. I encourage you to do the same. He, he states all the time, he says, I already got my pet animals picked out. He says, I want pet lions like that. In fact, and he's putting a stake of faith, and he says, I already got them named, Leo and Cleo. <laughs> Can I encourage you to do something, Christian? In all seriousness, pick out your animals and name them because that's our future. That's what Christ won for us. It isn't just he saved us from eternal damnation and hell, and praise God for that. It's not just the forgiveness of our sins that made that possible, and praise God for that. It's not just right now he indwells us by his spirit, the Holy Spirit, in great intimacy before we get to see him face to face, and praise God for that. But we're going to heaven, but after heaven, while the earth is being ravaged, God's going to renovate it in the garden being like conditions, and we get to experience that. Yeah. No wonder the church that does not teach on prophecy. Where am I getting this? Bible prophecy. And, and no wonder God said, I'll bless your socks off. And no wonder the church that refuses to teach on Bible prophecy, talk about a rotten advertisement for Jesus. You're walking around, hey, you need to get saved and be like me. Doom, disclare, and agony. Uh, the spirit of he all theology is all over him. It looks like your diet is pickles, sour limbs, and prunes. That's a bad advertisement for Jesus. But listen, if you know what he saved us for, the future. Amen. Makarios in the Greek, I'm not just blessed. I'm blessed with what? I got to pay somebody to slap this smile off. Aren't you just a little bit more joyful? I'm not doing this. God's doing it by his spirit through his word. Amen. One man says about the millennial kingdom, watch this. He says, under the direction of Jesus Christ, the resurrected believers of the church will provide the leadership necessary for a just society for mankind on the whole planet. Listen, the greatest adventure we could ever imagine awaits for us in the reality of the kingdom of Christ. Why should I study Bible prophecy? Because it reminds me that my greatest adventure awaits. The more I study it and read it and hear it and take to heart, I am blessed over and over again. It's not difficult. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But we got one more. Remember, he said a triple fold blessing. And I hope this is really as cool as what we've seen so far. I hope this is really what you're looking forward to. We're going to get to see Jesus. No more of this invisible stuff. And I don't know about you, but I'm hoping like that picture to be able to give him a hug and say, thank you. While I was still a sinner, doomed straight to hell, God, thank you for dying for me. And when you talk about the return of Jesus Christ, all heaven is busting loose. Every time we hear news about the return of Jesus Christ, which is what really is going on in the news, hello. All it is is God's, hey, it's getting close. It's getting close. What's getting close? Not just the rapture. What happens? All this future we're talking about. It's God's loving way of saying, get excited, right? I'm coming back. This, your future is coming. What I want for you, right? And when you talk about the return of Jesus Christ, whether it's current events, because that's really what you're doing. It's a reminder that Jesus comes. Oh, hey, thank you for sharing that on the news, uh, CNN or Communist News Network, whatever you stand for, and <laughs> all that stuff. Uh, I almost forgot today that Jesus comes. That's all it is, translated for what it is. But when you talk about the return of Jesus Christ, all of heaven is busting loose, man. And that should be our attitude, right? I didn't say that. Where am I getting this? Bible prophecy. You're seeing a common thread here. Revelation 19, 1 through 9. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ, us with him at the end of the seven-year tribulation. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting hallelujah salvation and glory and power belong to our god for true and just are his judgments he's condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries he's avenged on her the blood of his servants and again they shouted hallelujah the smoke from her goes up forever and ever the 24 elders us the church and the four living creatures fell down to worship god who was seated on the throne and they cried amen hallelujah and then a voice came from the throne saying praise our god all you his servants you who fear him both small and great and then i heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder shining. Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Why? Because the wedding of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said, right, blessed. Again, there it is, are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. In other words, you can bank on it, folks. You can take it to the bay. Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to put it into all this baloney.
But when you hear news, when heaven hears the news, that's what's going on here, of the return of Jesus Christ. And again, I challenge you, that's what you need to translate. Every message you hear today, Lord willing, every time you hear a Bible prophecy related topic in the news, every single time, you need to translate it and start having a praise service. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, give him glory. Why? Because it's a reminder that Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to throw us, his bride, an incredible wedding party. And God knows how to party. <laughs> and I know what he parties with. Luke 15, 23. When God throws a party, he says, bring in the fatted calf. Not chicken, people. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Why do you think there's hamburgers today? We're being biblical. Right, Pastor Tom, wherever you are? Anyway. <laughs> But Jesus is coming back, man. And that's when all this gets to put into play, the millennial kingdom, all that stuff. And then even after that, you have the new heavens, the new earth, no more mourning cry. It's all awesome. This is our future. Yeah. The one who won all this for us. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's going to throw us an amazing wedding party. Woo-wee. And folks, Jesus, he's the ultimate king. In fact, yeah, it makes me cry too when I think about it. Right? Uh, but one guy, he puts it this way. Watch this. The Bible says, my king, he's a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's my king. Do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that's ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is God's son. He's the center savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He is unique. He's unparalleled and he's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He is the miracle of the age. He is, yes, he is the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. Do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards. He guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges the debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent and beautifies the meek. Do you know him? My king is the key way to knowledge, the wellspring to wisdom, the doorway to deliverance, the pathway to peace, the roadway to righteousness, the highway to heaven, and the gateway to glory. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I wish I could to describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. And that's my king. That's my king. He's got the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, ever. Amen. Do you know him? We get to see King Jesus face to face. Why did God say, if you would just read all my word, and certainly Bible prophecy, you know what I'm going to do? And tell me this isn't the antidote we need today. We need to get back to Bible prophecy. <laughs> this is why you need to be excited when you have shepherds like Pastor Tom and Pastor Brandon who will teach you all God's word in Bible prophecy. Because you'll be blessed. Not just once in a while, but the more you read it and hear it and take it to heart, it reminds us of the future. That's what the enemy doesn't want us to know. He wants us to get focused on the earth. The scripture says, keep your mind on things above, not on this earth. This earth will drag you down. But we're not saved for this version of the earth. We're saved for this one to come. And nobody can take it away. Every time I study Bible prophecy, I am blessed beyond measure. Why? Because I'm reminded I'm going to heaven, a place beyond my wildest dreams. I'm going to the millennium where my greatest adventure awaits. And I get to see my King Jesus face to face who loved me and won all this for me, in spite of me.